Hello and welcome to episode three of A Day in the Half-Life, a podcast about the fascinating and often unexpected ways that science evolves over time. Today, we're focusing on making stuff with microbes, otherwise known as biomanufacturing and synthetic biology. Uh, let's talk about the definition of synthetic biology. Uh, the definition of synthetic biology is the engineering of biology to develop some type of function or to produce some kind of product. That's Jay Keesling. He's a big name in synthetic biology and has a lot of experience in getting microbes to produce useful compounds. He is currently CEO of the Joint Bioenergy Institute, senior scientist at Berkeley Lab, and a professor at UC Berkeley. And I have been following Jay's work on synthetic biology since my grad school. And with that, I think uh, the advantage or one of the um, uses of synthetic biology comes very handy in biomanufacturing. So biomanufacturing is a field where we employ living organisms, could be microbes or plants, to produce, um, basically manufacture commercially relevant biomolecules, could be chemicals, could be biomaterials or fuels. And that was Deepika Awasthi, a project scientist at Berkeley Lab focused on developing new biomanufacturing processes. These days, many of the everyday products we encounter are made by engineered microorganisms, including a large number of medicines, new materials, beauty product ingredients, and meat and dairy substitutes. And the list of products grows every year as manufacturers are replacing traditional production methods with more efficient and eco-friendly biomanufacturing processes, or are turning to biomanufacturing to create valuable products that would be impossible to make otherwise. Deepika and Jay are a great pair to give us the backstory on biomanufacturing and tell us how this field works. So Jay, welcome. Let's start at the beginning. When would you say synthetic biology first arose and what knowledge and tools had to come first before we could even dream of programming cells to perform new functions? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I, I would say that it's been more of an evolution than a revolution. So we gained the ability to cut and paste DNA to make recombinant DNA in the early 70s. And since that time, uh, scientists have engineered microbes to produce human growth hormone, uh, human insulin, um, and those were generally uh, engineering one gene at a time into an organism. And with time, um, we gained the scientific know-how to control many genes to build genetic circuits. Um, and some of those genetic circuits first appeared, um, complex genetic circuits, that is, first appeared in the early 2000s. What's a genetic circuit? So it, if you think about an electrical circuit, electrical circuit would take in uh, information and it would then have an action, um, turning on a thermostat, turning on a light switch, taking in some information from the outside world and having some action. Similarly for biology, um, circuits became possible because the biology could sense some change in the environment. You add a chemical to a microbe, you do so, it sees light for instance, and then it has some action. It turns on the expression of a gene that maybe turns the microbe green or it produces a product. Um, or it oscillates on and off, green and not green, green and not green. Um, so so um, those kinds of complex circuits first kind of became possible or were demonstrated in the early 2000s. And, and with time, it's grown to, um, it, uh, or, or the field has demonstrated that you can engineer microbes to produce really complex products. Um, materials um, that wouldn't have been able to be produced any other way to sequester carbon from the atmosphere in new ways and transform it into new products. And even to produce some extremely valuable 
therapeutics. And so what microbes in particular have been used for this function and why those microbes? Well, early on, the most popular microbes were the microbes that were known the best, uh, E. coli, the organism that lives in the human gut and um, is widely studied. In fact, one of the most widely studied organisms was first used because it was easy to get DNA into and out of it. It was easy to turn on uh, gene expression. Um, It expanded into organisms like yeast, which we use to produce bread and wine and beer, because again, the organism was well known, it was well studied, um, and it really used as a model um, eukaryote um, to to study higher organisms like humans and, and other organisms. But what's great about the field of synthetic biology is that now it's advancing into other organisms, organisms that are not as well known but with tools like CRISPR, we can now engineer those organisms almost as easily as we could engineer E. coli and yeast. And so what are some early applications of products that were made using these microbes? Well, the most early products, things like human growth hormone and human insulin, of course, were made for as human therapeutics and replaced the versions that were extracted from cadavers or extracted from pigs or some other form. Um, As we got better at making complicated products, those go into things like materials. Um, There are uh, flavors and fragrances out on the market now that are made using engineered organisms. Um, We see uh, a a form of yeast being engineered to produce the heme that goes into the Impossible Burger to uh, make the flavor that you get when you grill the Impossible Burger and and to make it look bloody as well. So um, the the range of products is growing dramatically as we become better and better at engineering the biology. And Jay, you were involved in a lot of those early experiments to sort of first harness and and utilize microbes, you utilize their ability to, to produce compounds. What was the earliest pathway that you worked on? Well, one of the earliest pathways was uh, a pathway uh, to produce isoprenoids. So isoprenoids are a large family of natural products. They include some really great um, therapeutics like Taxol, an anti-cancer drug, artemisinin, an anti-malarial drug. Um, as well as uh, the, the, the scent of mint um, and the flavor of mint um, and a lot of other flavors and fragrances, um, as well as um, the red color in tomatoes, um, for instance. Mm. <laughs> um, so we engineered this pathway first in E. coli and then in yeast. And then we um, learned about artemisinin in this anti-malarial drug. And so we launched into engineer uh, an organism to produce a, a low-cost version of artemisinin. And uh, that that product got commercialized. It's been out on the market in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, and it launched a company called Amaris um, that is using that same organism that was engineered to produce artemisinin, but now to produce other products. So what are the benefits of using microbes in these situations? I mean, for these compounds, you know, why not just grow a field of the plants that produce these compounds? You know, why has it turned out to be that microbes such as E. coli and yeast are just so amazing at becoming natural factories? I mean, look at the size, how many plants you have to grow. Right, (laughs) right. When you have big plants, that's the amount of material you have to throw out in the waste as residue. With microbes, as smaller you get, as Um, less biomaterial you throw out in residue and you can make a more purified product. Like sometimes it is 90% of the um, dry weight of the microbe is actually the product. Whereas in plants, you can never achieve that. Then um, the cost and everything of making that molecule drastically slows down. Because if you have to grow a plant, you need land, fertilizers, water. And I think microbes are also easier to genetically manipulate the life cycle of the product. Like, you know, 
you can make that product within 24 hours, 48 hours in a microbe. That's the whole life cycle. Right. You don't have to wait for the plant to grow. Yeah. Those are the various advantages. That's like, as Jay was saying, that there are so many animal farms. Why one has to produce heme? It's for the same reason. For an animal farm, you still need land resources, food for the animal and everything. But when you start making these meats, you can isolate the actual content, which is giving you nutrition, not every other junk that you have to eat with it. So microbes give you a very directed and focused approach with, you know, reduced cost. And many of these molecules, as, as Deepika as mentioned, are super rare inside the plant. And so you'd have to grow huge quantities of the plant to get just a little bit. That taxol, which is this anti-cancer drug, $2 billion a year drug. Um, it's extracted from the bark of the Pacific yew tree. And you would extinct all of the Pacific use on the planet in a year if you just wanted, to, if, if your only source um, for, for taxol was that tree. Um, fortunately, there are other routes to produce it. There are plant cell cultures where they've taken a piece of the Pacific U and they grow that plant cell culture in, in tanks. And now we have a project going in to try to take the genes out of the Pacific U, put them into yeast and get yeast to produce it. We're still quite a few years away from that because it's such a complicated molecule, but you can do all of these things. And, and what's more, once you've built the chemical factory that contains the tanks that these microbes grow in, you can produce many different products in those tanks. You know, today you might grow up a yeast that produces um, mint oil. And then tomorrow you might put a different yeast in it that, that produces taxol. And the following day, you might put a yeast in it that will produce a, a, a new polymer material um, that you could put, you know, on the screen of your cell phone or something like that. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. And yet the, the inputs to that are the same. You just need sugar to feed your yeast. Uh, so, Jay, what do you think would be limiting, you know, in the kind of products that we are not making that could be looked into in the future? Yeah, so um, I think materials is a really interesting area because, you know, the materials that we use largely are either based on things like wood and concrete or they're based on petroleum. And many of those materials like plastics and, and, and things like nylon were kind of afterthoughts. They had molecules in um, the, the petroleum industry from refining petroleum to make fuels. And they looked at what they could do with those. And, you know, nylon is a super important discovery. And some of these plastics are super important discoveries. But that doesn't mean that those materials are great. They're not great necessarily for the environment because they're not easily recyclable, many of them, um, and they accumulate in the environment. And maybe we can make materials using biology that will have more functionality, different functionality, especially for you know this um, economy we have that's based on uh, electronics and batteries and all kinds of of new materials we need. So um, I wanted to kind of talk about the interim between the early days and looking toward the future. Jay, you mentioned that it's been more of a slow evolution. Have there been sort of big breakthrough moments that have pushed through like the punctuated equilibrium? And if so, what were those breakthroughs and what did they enable? Oh, sure. There've been, there've been uh, lots of, of breakthroughs. I mean, uh, CRISPR would be a breakthrough. I think that has enabled uh, the engineering of a lot more organisms than was possible before and facile engineering of those. Um, you know, if we go back uh, in history, the ability to uh, cut DNA, um, to put pieces of DNA together, that was a breakthrough that allowed uh, genetic engineering just to exist. But yeah, there've been, there've been lots of breakthroughs that um, have have helped accelerate the evolution of the field. Yeah. 
I, I remember when I was in college and doing experiments, um, I realized later somebody got a Nobel Prize on that was how the, the use of these uh, polymerases to amplify a DNA sequence. <laughs> and as an undergrad student, that was so amazing to me that, you know, you can do a, a Xerox copy and that makes it so easier for us to, you know, with just very small amount of DNA or um, that you have, you can make a million copies and your efficiency of, you know, uh, genetic manipulations and all increases uh, because you can assemble that somewhere else <laughs> and then put it together in a different host. And another thing was um, that uh, I really, that fascinated me was DNA sequencing and how quick it is coming to US, <laughs> like overnight and you get sequences back. So to, to be able to read the genetic code, I mean, um, so the genetic code was, uh, I think, deciphered like uh, maybe in 60s or 70s. But now the, the way we can like um, just sequence it so fast and then like in, in a classroom, we can do these experiments. It was like writing alphabets and now we are, we are making words and then sentences. So, um, and, and the ability to write DNA and not just any old DNA, but know exactly what you want to write and how it's going to impact the cell. And we're still at a very early stage on that. The ability to design biology is, is at its infancy, but um, it's so incredibly powerful and will be so incredibly powerful in the future. Yeah, like um, there are so many, we, we say that we are only able to um, bring to lab just 0.1% of microbes which are out there. Still 99% are not, we don't have the ability to culture them. But with this genomic sequencing facility right now, we can like get the whole population and sequence it and just pick out what we need <laughs> and you know clone it through PCR and then put it in the host we require. So that is... That is something like now we are not waiting on um, every microbiologist going out there and isolating and figuring out a media, how to culture it. Um, we can just pick what we want from the DNA. It's a very good point. There's, there's this ability to, to sequence and sequence an entire population. And then when you think about all the people and all of the sequencing centers that have been doing that now over decades, um, we have uh, an enormous library at our fingertips, a library of biology um, that we can use um, to write new stories. I see. So one thing that I definitely wanted to ask you both about and so excited to hear are surprises in your career, um, moments where you discovered something that worked incredibly well, like perhaps even way better than you expected. And then also the moments where something that you were trying sort of fell flat, but in both cases, how you might've learned something really great from those. Jay, you, please, you start. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a fair number of successes and a fair and lots of, of failures. Um, and I've always tried to learn from the failures. Um, I've always liked to have the failures <laughs> occur as quickly as possible. <laughs> Uh, and the successes sometimes take longer mm. for them to play out. A, a good example of, um, I think, a success and a surprise in the laboratory was when we were engineering yeast to produce artemisinin, the anti-malarial drug. And we had discovered the enzyme that was the key step uh, to produce artemisinic acid, the precursor to artemisinin. And the first candidate that we put into yeast worked. Um, it, it did more of the chemistry than we thought it would do. Um, it did essentially three steps in one step, um, which saved us a huge amount of time. And it occurred very early on in the project, which was also really nice. And I attribute this to team members in my laboratory who, who were thinking very deeply about the problem and, and, um, working on all aspects of it and, and planning for, you know, the, the possibility that it wouldn't work, but also the possibility that it would work. And so I fully attribute it to those very smart um, and hardworking people. And is that anti-malarial, the, the strain that you developed, is that still currently being used to make supplies of medicine? Um, so the goal of that project was to produce artemisinin and to give another source besides the plant version. 
And um, ever since that process based on the microbe has been introduced, the price of artemisinin has been low and stable. Um, it was used uh, early on um, a few years ago. Now it's, it's idled because the um, artemisinin uh, that's produced by the plant is so inexpensive right now. There's so much being produced. Um, but that will change with time. The prices will go back up. And that organism, the, the great thing about synthetic biology and about engineering microbes to produce these things, is we can just pull it out of the freezer, we can grow it, and, and in a matter of days or weeks, you can have a supply on hand. But that same organism now has been re-engineered by Amaris, and they have cosmetics that are being produced um, using this engineered yeast that was first engineered for producing artemisinin. And, and that's uh, saving sharks because they're, they're, there's a key molecule that would normally be derived from shark livers, um, uh, producing a, a, a sugar substitute that is a low calorie, uh, very um, good sweetener. So there's a variety of products that are now being produced and on the market in the hands of consumers um, from that original yeast that was engineered for producing artemisinin. Wow. And what was that yeast, like, what, what is that yeast up to in the wild? <laughs> what does it do if it's not genetically engineered? Producing ethanol and bread. All right. So great. It's like mankind's favorite microbe. Exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> no. Uh, so, yeah, I think my experience has been with the, my PhD work and my postdoc work here so far. And um, I think one of the projects uh, when I came to JB was on methanotroph engineering. So what is a methanotroph? So methanotroph is um, a microbe that exclusively grows on methane. Methane is a single carbon gas. You know, it's a, it's a component of natural gas that we burn and it's a co-product made by these thermochemical processes or microbial processes that made crude oil. So uh, we were looking at this technology of, you know, how we can make use of, you know, natural gas to make uh, some value-added chemicals. But these methanotrophs, the problem with these gas um, utilizing hosts is they grow very slow. And it's very difficult to, if you cannot grow them well, the next challenge is how you engineer them. So um, there were uh, initial, some challenges of, you know, uh, like working on, on establishing a facility, how to grow methanotrophs and all. But what I've learned in that science is a very collaborative field. You cannot do things alone you need uh, guidance and or at least you know it's it's always to talk to people who have expertise so by the duration of the project I was able to produce a small amount of the biosurfactant that we wanted to produce so that is going to be a replacement for petrochemical industry based produced you know surfactants and detergents right now it is a proof of concept but it can be you know further engineered to do that so I mean whenever anything for me, um, as Jay was saying, that failures will be a part of, you know, the work. Um, but I think for science, um, doing these synthetic biology and uh, metabolic engineering for some time, I, to me, no is not the answer. I always have to find out why there is this no, you know, and you can make the no into something. <laughs> because if it is not working, I'm always curious to find out, like, why? why this is not working. And if I do not answer the why, like why this is not growing, I will never, like my methanotroph is not growing. And if I do not answer why it was not growing, I would never go back and fix the issue that why it was not growing. So yeah, so th my way of approaching would be, would have been that. And um, so I have fallen flat, <laughs> but I have picked up <laughs> myself and yeah, I was able to engineer the most. <laughs> Thanks. So. Hearing you both talk about the different strains you've worked with, it sounds a little bit like you're discussing unruly pets yeah. <laughs> at some times. <laughs> That's the right word. Um, so I, of course, wanted to talk a little bit about, um, with biomanufacturing, a, a lot of the applications that I think of at least are, are medicine, but there's also so many materials that can be developed using biomanufacturing and so many possibilities for uh, sustainable technologies. So Jay, I know that you have a lot of expertise in synthetic biology and biomanufacturing as it pertains to sustainable fuels. And I was hoping you could give us a little bit of a highlight about what's going on with that now. Yeah, so um, it's a great question. Uh, we can uh, engineer microbes to produce 
fuels that are great replacements for petroleum-based fuels, the kinds of high, similar to the kinds of hydrocarbons that you would derive from petroleum. Um, and the microbe can produce those from sugar. And, and the beauty of that process is that sugar might come from a plant and that plant grows on carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So you have a plant that takes up sunlight, carbon dioxide, fixes it, makes it into a sugar. You extract the sugar from the plant, feed it to the microbe, the microbe produces a fuel. And when you burn that fuel in a car or a truck or a plane, then that carbon is renewed, returned to the atmosphere. So you have this possibility of having carbon neutral fuels where you don't add additional carbon to the atmosphere from producing those transportation fuels. We see uh, a lot of automobiles and trucks moving to electrification. And this is a great thing. As long as the electricity is made from sunlight or wind uh, or some renewable source, then you're not adding carbon to the atmosphere when you drive those electric vehicles. But for planes, it's gonna be more challenging because um, batteries don't ha yet have the energy density that, that petroleum fuels do um, and, and these liquid hydrocarbons. And that density is critical because if you wanna get a plane off the ground, uh, you can't have all of the weight of the plane being in that storage material. It's gotta be in something really dense. So um, with biology, we can make um, fuels that are, are great replacements for petroleum-based fuels and they'll be carbon neutral. The challenge right now is price um, and, and making them in a way that will compete with, with petroleum-based fuels, because these are incredibly inexpensive molecules. Um, even, even when our gas price, uh, the price of the pump goes up to you know, $4 a gallon, when you think about the energy that you're getting for $4, it's, it's a trivial amount of money. And replicating that using biology where you're growing plants in the field, that's, that's, that's pretty challenging, but the promise is there. And, you know, with some, some um, policy, um, a regulation on the amount of carbon put into the atmosphere or a price of, uh, on the carbon you put into the atmosphere that isn't renewable carbon, then that could make change everything and make those fuels um, realistic. Would also an investment in some scientific infrastructure lower the cost? Is there also just a lack of facilities that can make it on the scale needed? Um, certainly, uh, those those fuel manufacturing plants, those biorefineries that are going to take in all of that sugar um, or the plant material that's made uh, in 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 farms across the planet, um, and then transform that carbon source into a fuel. Those are expensive undertakings. Building those factories, you know, those those cost. Um, you know, on the order of 200 million to a billion dollars or more. And if you look at the big petroleum refineries, those are many billions of dollars. Um, so, so to outfit the planet with these refineries, these biorefineries that are going to transform agriculture waste into fuels is going to be an expensive undertaking. And in order to get that money, you have to be sure that, you know, the people who loan the money for, for building those have to be sure that they're going to get their money back. And, and so that's why we have to have um, the, the biofuel production process be economically viable. And there is an added advantage to the process, definitely. Like these will be drop in fuels. We don't have to like switch our cars and all transportation industry to EV. We can just use our current running vehicles and cars, right? So um, I think that is one very big advantage of using the biofuel, biomass to biofuel pipeline. And a lot of for a lot of people, I mean, when I hear the term biomass, I don't necessarily know where that's coming from, but a lot of this plant material that could be used for fuel is in fact currently just waste products um, or otherwise unused, correct? Yeah, there's a lot of this out there. So so let's just take California, for instance. We have all of these wildfires um, in, in forested land. And part of the reason that those burn so hot right now is because they haven't, because we prevented them from burning uh, more regularly as they would if, if they weren't tended by humans. 
And so they accumulate all of this plant material, fallen down trees, leaves, all those things. If we had a way to collect that and transform it into transportation fuels, not only could we reduce the occurrence of wildfires, um, but we would produce these carbon neutral fuels that could fuel our automobiles or trucks or our planes. Right. And, and there are other examples in, in agriculture, for instance, when um, you uh, grow a crop, a uh, food crop, you might take, you know, for instance, um, the rice from growing rice uh, and, and collect that. Decades ago, they used to burn the rice fields um, to burn off the biomass. They don't do that anymore because that's adding pollution to the atmosphere. But imagine that you collect that rice straw um, you 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 grow the rice, you have the food in the rice, but then you collect the rice straw and you haul that off and you have that uh, made into biofuels. You can have your food and your fuel all in one potential crop. So are the microbial strains that are needed for this process, do they already exist? I mean, I know obviously scale and investment and policy need to change as well, but um are the microbes that would be needed sort of already at the point of engineering where they could be doing this on a bigger scale? So, yeah, I think if you look about, if you talk about the drop in biofuels and all, you know, these are um, toxic chemicals. A lot of cells do not naturally survive them. Um, otherwise, we could have isolated those hosts right now, right, in our lab, which can grow on petrochemicals. So uh, through engineering, we are giving capabilities and abilities to these hosts. And um, there is also a substitute, right, biofuel, which is ethanol. I think 10% ethanol is added to gasoline. But as Jay was mentioning earlier, that there is an energy density gap between, you know, that uh, biofuel, which is there, which comes from sugar fermentation, but what we are trying to develop so that, you know, we can use them in planes and all. So those microbial strains, which can actually make that the next generation biofuel that we are developing, they're in the, I think they are in the developmental stage to meet that target of, you know, to be able to produce that amount of fuel from sugar fermentation that can be commercialized. But yeah, it's, it's on the path. <laughs> it's on the path. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the challenges is um, we're, we're robbing the cells of, materials and energy that they would normally use to make themselves. So cells will take in sugar and they use that then to, to replicate, to make more cells. And we're pulling a lot of that off and turning it into a fuel or forcing the cell to turn it into a fuel. Those cells would rather not do that. Right. So, so biology has this great thing called evolution. And those cells will evolve away from producing your product. And so there's always this, this tension between what the cells would like to do and what we would like them to do. And eventually the, the, the cells win out. They always win out. Biology always uh, moves toward evolution and they evolve away from wanting to produce your fuel. And then you have to go back and clean out the tanks and start with, you know, a new generation of those microbes um, where, you know, the majority of them are producing your, your product. Wow. I did, I did not know that, that you're kind of always forcing the needle a little bit back exactly. all the time. That's fascinating. Jay, earlier you mentioned that there is a huge interest in making materials through biomanufacturing. What's the advantage of biomanufacturing for this application? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think the, the motivation for making materials is, is multifold. One is, is to make materials that we currently don't have available because chemistry and petroleum precursors are are limiting. And by using biology, we can make materials with completely new properties that, that might have some advantage. Um, another reason to make materials is maybe it's, it's toxic to the environment to make those materials in that, in that particular way, using chemistry and using petroleum. And maybe we can make them in a more environmentally friendly way with less inputs of energy or less harmful side products being produced in the process. Um, 
And then, you know, there's a whole range of, of products like plastics that have accumulated in our environment. And if we could produce plastics that were biodegradable, for instance, um, and compostable, we have a few of these available, but not many because they don't necessarily have the properties of the petroleum-based plastics. And just like petroleum-based fuels, petroleum-based plastics are really cheap. And so, um, uh, again, here's, a, here's an area where the science, the biology um, dovetails with regulation. If we had a regulation on um, uh, or plastics that don't degrade um, and that all plastics must be either um, compostable or readily recyclable, then that would encourage and, and allow for these slightly more expensive plastics um, to come to market easier. Um, I I feel that it is we should see that our dependence on petroleum is not currently only on gasoline, but as you know, on all the materials, you know, like from your microphones polymer that is <laughs> wrapping up the wire to the hair clips and the clothes we are wearing, and you know, you see anything around your room, a lot of that material has come out at some point of time as a chemical from the gasoline or petroleum refining process. So if you are looking at a replacement fuel, um, we will still be digging out crude oil for every other need that we have. So it is very important, like we not only think about fuels, but all these materials, replacement materials too. Interesting. Yeah, I don't think I, that's not something I really think about on a day-to-day -day basis is just how much around me yeah. is from petroleum. You know, I feel so good about myself because I just got a hybrid and, <laughs> you know, but my dependency in other areas has not gone yeah. down at all. Um, There's, can I, if I just, oh, yeah. interesting aspect of your hybrid though. Um, and that is that companies like Toyota are, are, uh, really encouraging the development of new materials for those same hybrid cars. Um, uh, for instance, uh, some of the plastics are, are now compostable plastics or are uh, being produced using biology. Really? Yeah. So, so it's not just about efficiency of the automobile. It's also that many of the interior parts of that car are also environmentally friendly and, um, uh, renewable. Yeah, I when I go to the supermarket now, I see like the shampoo says it's organic and even the bottle is also made from, you know, biodegradable plastic. You buy organic milk and the carton is like, you know, uh, made from recycled or refurbished or you repurposed plastics or something. So it's the same thing with Toyota, I think. Now they are thinking of, you know, it's not just the hybrid, but the overall impact should be hybrid. <laughs> yeah. It's it's good to know that there are some avenues where the consumer driven consumer preferences can help, um, you know, really push these technologies, push people like both of you, uh, to, you know, to get more funding for your work to advance this, because a lot of it does seem, you know, with big industry to sort of be out of our hands as consumers. So that is heartening to hear. OK, so we've talked a lot about cool applications for biomanufacturing in materials and in fuels. But one area that I really wanted to talk about is in medicine, because that is an area where a lot of people are hoping for new and improved technologies. The Pika, you told me that you're working on using microbes and microbiomes to develop new therapeutics. Can you tell me more about that? Um, yeah. So um, I have recently, like with the onset of COVID, I started working on a probiotic vaccine technology and idea that I had been thinking about for some time. So probiotics are um, the bacteria or microbes, which we take uh, as oral supplements. Uh, most of us, you know, and they are over the counter. You can buy them. They're in our yogurt. Yeah, yogurt, right? So we we normally eat them. They're not something which is toxic to us. Um, they, they only help us in our digestion and producing some type of vitamins and all that. So we always focus our synthetic biology efforts so far on identifying, you know, the molecules of interest and the pathways to produce them in alternate you know, microbes, uh, getting them in, to be produced from microbes. But what we take for granted is the recovery and purification process that happens next. And it's a very time consuming and expensive process. Coming to medicine and pharma, the product purification costs do add up because they're something which is getting injected to the blood or say um, 
through nasal sprays or something, it has to come through to a very, you know, a very purified form, like 99.9% purity is the time. Right. And that made me think like, either I can overproduce that one molecule itself, or I think so a certain category of molecules can be produced in probiotics that can directly, you know, um, be absorbed through our intestine. So our our intestine and like gut is designed for absorption purposes because we eat food, right? So um, we can, um, I, I think that our intestine and gut is a very good target for absorption of these medicinal or therapeutic molecules. And you will not have to purify the product. Right. Because I think that that's a thing that I, I myself don't think about when you're taking a medicine that's derived from a cell that had to be produced by a cell, which a lot of people do, um, everything else about that cell, all the proteins, all the other things that it produced, all of that has to be taken away to get that one thing. And so what you're doing is amazing because you don't have to worry about that. Worry about that, right? So like humulin or human growth hormone, all these were produced in E. coli. So E. coli is... Um, is an opportunistic pathogen sometimes. Opportunistic means like whenever your immunity is suppressed, then it might start, you know, showing infection uh, or symptoms of infection or fever and things like that. Or uh, uh, in a healthy human, E. coli might not, not show any symptom. So that means E. coli carries certain proteins or certain molecules, which we call them endotoxins, that um, may uh, start showing symptoms in people which are immunocompromised. And that's why when these humulin and human growth hormone at GH was produced, it was purified out of E. coli. And that happens even today, like anything, uh, E. coli has become this protein and molecule production factory. <laughs> but everything that is produced out of this factory has to be purified if it is being injected or given to us. Because, you know, we don't know who is going to take this, right? It could be an immunocompromised patient too. With probiotics, we eliminate risk of producing endotoxins because uh, we know that they do not. So how far along are you in this process and, and what are you currently working on? Um, so uh, this was a CARES Act funding project that I actually got for probiotic vaccine for COVID-19 uh, with the same concept that we would be eliminating the cost of the purification and recovery. Like if you look at the COVID vaccine now, which is from these um, pharmaceutical companies, they require cryogenic, that means uh, very low temperature preservation of minus 80 to minus 20. But we never see our yogurt being stored at minus 20. So that is more approachable and accessible um, if you have low temperature requirement of storage for these um, hosts that are expressing vaccine. So this type of vaccine would eliminate the need for purification because you're taking the whole microbe also cut down on the supply chain demands like we saw um, being such an issue early on in the pandemic in 2020. Yeah. And then it could also take the pressure off of clinics and hospitals as having to administer it. Exactly. You don't need needles. You don't need to go to the hospitals. And we don't even know maybe Amazon will start selling it. You can just order it through app, <laughs> through Instacart. <laughs> that way it's available. You know, I should get... So many doses for like, you know, at home. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> with Like with your weekly groceries. That would be so. amazing. Yeah. And so many of us are eating yogurt or, or as you mentioned, taking probiotics anyways. And I think this anyways, is really yeah. exciting. And, you know, I think it's also makes sense as a next step because so much of biology right now is, is realizing the importance of microbiomes. And I see, you know, medicine kind of going the way of microbial community based mm -hmm. instead of the one isolated molecule, lo looking at what communities of microbes can do. Exactly. Yeah. How I see it as that as human beings, we have co-evolved with bacteria. We did not evolve in a very clean environment. Microbes existed before us. So factually, our body has less amount of cells our, um, compared to the microbes that live upon or inside us. So <laughs> they outnumber us in our own uh, like count of cells. So they definitely do. They have a purpose in our body. So um, a few years ago, there was a human genome project, right? A very big genome project. And after that, um, I, I still see that um, people say that these genes they predict it may cause cancer, but there is no guarantee that if there is a deletion, cancer will happen. And there is also not a guarantee that if gene is correct, the cancer will not happen. 
so what is like what is the gap which is making it just probable and not complete is i think because again we have co-evolved with these hosts and they have a role to play so with the microbiome project we may be you know moving into a future to where we bridge these uh, our you know knowledge gap into how these thing uh, how microbiome is interacting with our body then i think we can f- uh, target the medicine through gut yeah since our interview Deepika has gotten farther along in her phase 1 study of a probiotic vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. After engineering a strain of probiotic microbe to produce the virus's spike protein, she and her colleagues began testing how well the vaccine concept works when orally administered to a strain of mice. These mice were specially bred to produce the human version of the ACE2 receptor. which is the cell surface receptor that the virus binds to so that it can enter the cell, begin replicating itself, and initiate the cycle of infection. The team is now almost ready to analyze whether the bacteria triggered an immune reaction in the mice and to assess if the response was strong enough to confer immune protection. Thanks for joining me and I hope you tune in next time for more insider science stories.